Ooh, that's a little loud. I'll try not to talk loudly, which is hard for me. Um, thanks for being here this morning, bright and early. It's Wednesday, which I guess is better than Monday, as someone said a few minutes ago, but uh, still first thing, and I appreciate it. Um, I'm Jacob West. I'm Chief Technology Officer for Security Products at HP, and I lead a group, group called uh, HP Security Research. This is a fantastic uh, team. I'm really excited to work with them. They get to work on uh, organic research areas like malware, vulnerability, software security research, tracking threat actors. Uh, then they get to, we get to take that research and deliver it through HP's products and to HP's customers and in the form of thought leadership broadly to the security community. So it's, in my opinion, a team filled with some of the smartest, coolest people at HP, and it's, it's really a pleasure to work with them. Um, my background is out of a company called Fortify Software. It was acquired by HP back in 2010. Um, many uh, current and former colleagues here in the room today. And uh, my job there early on was as a researcher. And I was a researcher. I went on to build the research team. Now I lead a, a team of uh, researchers doing a lot of other things at HP. But it's, it's really been a fantastic experience to work in particular with OWASP over these years. You know, my background is in software security. It's in software security research. And so it's great to be here with a, a group of folks like you guys talking about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart. Today, I'm not mostly going to talk about software security, though. Today, mostly, I want to talk about um, where the adversaries are today in terms of their capabilities. Um, some models and ways of thinking about those capabilities and understanding how we interact with the adversaries, in particular, so we can more effectively disrupt them. And uh, in particular, talk about how the industry can do a better job at collaborating, particularly by sharing in as near real time as possible information about the attacks they're seeing, analysis of those attacks, and in some cases, hopefully, mitigations or responses to the attacks so that uh, we can start to present, as an industry, a more unified front. We know that the bad guys are attacking us with the same techniques again and again. Right now, we're fighting all those battles one at a time. We could do a much better job of responding in a, a, a coherent, collaborative way. And so that, that's a point that I want to leave you guys with today. So uh, I just finished, as I mentioned, I came from Fortify, and I just uh, experienced my 10-year anniversary, if you count from when I joined Fortify as an intern back in 2004 all the way through to today. And I guess that has me uh, feeling a little nostalgic about the industry and where we've, where we've come from, where we're going, where we are now. So I want to start off just by taking a few sort of snapshots in time uh, leading up to the problem that we have today. So first off, when did the problem begin? Well, the problem began when we started decoupling software and hardware, right? So in the 60s, IBM started shipping software systems that weren't physically part of a hardware package that you got from them as well. And as soon as these things got decoupled, we started introducing the possibility of software behaving uh, in ways that the programmer didn't intend. We started adding more uh, flexibility in the behavior of the software, and that added more opportunity for bad guys to do stuff that the designer or the developer didn't plan for them to do. So pretty early on, we figured out that it was important to verify the code that we wrote to try to avoid these mistakes, right? to keep it as straight and narrow as possible. And so things like the Orange Book standard uh, started to mandate or suggest uh, automated verification of code to find vulnerabilities, things like static analysis. Cool, that stuck around for a while. Around the same time, people started breaking stuff, right? As soon as we started wiring these systems together in more and more, uh, larger and larger networks, uh, we found ways to do damage to them. And so people like Robert Morris started exploiting systems, um, in this case for research purposes, but others for, for less uh, white hat reasons. And at the same time, um, or, or nearly uh, soon thereafter, people started automating those same techniques for breaking systems. So tools like Satan were the first uh, penetration testing products that replicated what attackers were doing to break into uh, these potentially vulnerable software systems. We've made some mistakes, and we've repeated them. So buffer overflow looks a lot like cross-site scripting, and we still see an awful lot of cross-site scripting today, not to mention an awful lot of buffer overflow still. But for the most part, and this is the part we should all be satisfied about, especially in a group like this. For the last decade or so, it has been accepted that security is one of the core requirements of the software that we build. It has to be built in. It can't be sprinkled on or layered around the software after it's finished. It's got to be a core requirement, just like performance and functionality have been for a long time. 
And that's, that's good. You know, in the, the time before, uh, before this became standard practice, a lot of people said, oh, I've got a firewall or an antivirus, or I pen test the crap out of it before I deploy it, and, and that tells me that it's safe. Now we've got a pretty universal concept that security has to come in from the, the bottom up. But where does that leave us? Um, it's nice, and looking around a group like this, it's fantastic to sort of pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, look, we've, we've got everybody treating security as a core component of what they do when they build software. But as an industry, we spend $46 billion, this is for 2013, trying to defend against cyber attacks, trying to protect these systems that we admit we need to build to be more secure, but, but still fail to do so, at least in every case. Worse than the 46 billion that we spend is that we're not getting more successful. We're becoming less successful in many ways, or at least the attackers are becoming more successful if you agree that it's zero sum. So also 2013 numbers, there was a 20% increase in breaches over 2012, so there were more breaches by a significant amount. And the more disturbing number is that the average cost of one of those breaches went up 30% over 2012. So not only were there more breaches, but on average, those breaches cost the target organizations substantially more than they did the year before. Why is that? So we face a inherent structural imbalance where the attacker has to be right every, sorry, the attacker only has to be right once. And we on the defending side have to be right every single time. So if the attacker comes after us a thousand times, and we block them, 999, that seems amazing, right? 99.9% .9 accuracy. The one time they get in puts our organization on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. They win, right? There's no, there's no cost to them in many, many failures as long as they have an eventual success. Worse yet, research shows that in 2014, we'll show up barely half staffed. So 40% of IT security roles will be vacant throughout 2014. Doesn't mean we have the wrong skill set or the wrong people in, the right, in, the, in, in particular roles. There aren't even butts in seats. We have no coverage for 40% of effectively the troops that are fighting those battles on our behalf. Now, I think it's appropriate that we're at a university because I, I slip in uh, a, a little tangent here that isn't always appropriate, but I think here it will be. Um, 40% of security roles are vacant. What about all the people that aren't in security roles but contribute to security on a daily basis? And in particular, I'm thinking of developers, but I think QA engineers, operations folks, anybody uh, who contributes to building, operating, deploying software has a role to play. And for the most part, these folks are not well equipped to solve the problem. Here's a chart that shows what it takes to become a doctor, at least in the United States. I think it probably looks fairly similar here, but I apologize for not localizing the slide. The important thing is it takes a long time. You're looking at eight to 12 years of school or, uh, or on the job, but still being overseen practice of your new skills. What about developers? Do we put developers through 12 years of training before we set them loose on systems that we all depend on? No. Developer is lucky if they go through a four-year undergraduate degree, right? We've got plenty of people, and it's easy to, to learn to code, to learn to build systems without any formal education. But we certainly don't put the level of postgraduate, ongoing, in-depth education into this that we do into the field of medicine. And I would hazard that there are a lot of similarities between these two fields. We both depend on them as a society a great deal. Both of them rely heavily on R&D, on advances in technology, advances in research, and both of them change very rapidly. So to be an effective doctor, to be an effective developer, you have to be able to stay on the cutting edge of technology and, and research effectively. So maybe it's okay, maybe we're giving undergraduates what they need in those four years to contribute to security in the right ways, to do a good job. Maybe that's not part of the problem. Um, this shows nine of the top 10 computer science uh, programs in the United States. Uh, we don't cover the 10th because Caltech doesn't publish their syllabi. But what we did is we dug through course syllabi for the undergraduate computer science degree track at each of these schools, and we graphed out um, how many courses, either elective or required, with either a complete focus on security or with at least one topic touching on security, 
those undergraduates likely experienced as part of their degree track. And the important color is, the other ones are interesting, but the really important color here is dark blue. How much dark blue do you see on the graph? It's hard to see, maybe. None. There's no dark blue on the graph. Dark blue is a required course with a focus on security. So if you graduated from one of the top computer science programs in the United States last year, this year effectively, there's no guarantee that you would have taken even a single course focused on security. You might have had a lecture or a week of lectures on it, but you won't have had any in-depth treatment whatsoever. And these are the top programs. So in the meantime, we're building these systems. We're going into battle sort of half-staffed. 40% of the seats are empty. The people building our systems, frankly, haven't been educated in the right ways to build them securely for the most part. And we're seeing an explosion on the adversar adversary side. Over the last few years, there's been a lot of discussion around different motivations behind threat actors, uh, whether they be hacktivist groups with social motivations, whether they be nation state backed, or just the natural evolution of organized crime into the digital space. I think talking too much about these individual motivations is kind of a red herring, though. The attackers are becoming more capable. They are putting more pressure on our understaffed security teams and our undereducated development teams. But the way they're doing that has nothing to do with what they're motivated by. So focusing on why they're doing these things is, is not interesting to me. I think we had to talk about how they are becoming so effective. So one way they are becoming effective is they're increasingly organized around an underground marketplace. And as with any other marketplace, as uh, we're in a school of economics, I believe, so it's an appropriate topic, uh, those market forces lead individual actors and groups to specialize because they can make more money on the market by being expert in a particular area of capability. And the result of that is they specialize and then they monetize those capabilities to provide services effectively to other threat actors, other adversaries. And what you see now today is that a large attack is typically comprised of multiple groups, one individual or group orchestrating other specialists to provide different aspects of the attack. And in order to effectively respond to this, this is what we should be focused on. We should be focused on the techniques and the ecosystem that they're using to compromise us or to be so successful. Uh, rather than on why they're doing that. That, that. That's interesting for spy novel material, but it doesn't really have much to do with mounting an effective defense. All of these factors are combining to put us under a lot of pressure. Um, there are more adversaries. Those adversaries are more effective, more specialized, more organized, and driving more monetary reward for themselves than ever. At the same time, we're understaffed. We're building more software than ever before. Our technology is evolving rapidly. Um, think of the adoption of mobile, for example. We've got developers that probably weren't that well prepared today, and now we're cycling them through ever more quickly changing technology stacks and expecting them to keep doing the right thing at the right time. This is a bad situation for the industry. We're, we're, we're in a tough spot, I would argue. And again, the thing that we need to do most is to start to work more together. And the starting point for that is to talk a little more about how one of these composite breaches uh, is actually affected. So when you have specialists working together, what do they specialize in? What are the boundaries between uh, different groups and different capabilities? So at HP, we like to talk about a five-stage uh, life cycle for an attack. And various models like this have been around in the industry for the last 10 years or more. Um, you could have seven steps. You could have three steps. Five, I think, is a good number, but, but you'll get the idea. First up, the adversary does research. They want to understand who their target is. Maybe they want to understand the technology profile. So what uh, server software do they run? What programming languages do they use? Uh, maybe what network security infrastructure do they have in place? Or maybe they want to research individuals at the organization. Uh, maybe they want profiles of the top 50 executives at HP so that they can then spearfish or do targeted attacks against those particular personas. Whatever it may be, there are actors out there who specialize in this research, gathering information, building profiles, and then they raise their hand on the underground and say, I have a profile of Hewlett Packard and their top 50 execs. Who would like to, to buy access to that? And you can go on forums today and see exactly information like this, hopefully not about HP, but certainly about other potential victims. From there, 
whoever buys that information goes on to use that to get an initial beachhead within the organization. This infiltration stage is about gaining some initial access, maybe by compromising a weakness in network security, maybe by compromising a vulnerable application, uh, maybe through social engineering. But whatever it might be, this is, uh, as I said, getting that beachhead, that initial uh, point to then launch further attacks within the organization. Then we have discovery. And this is one of the most important phases. Um, internal research shows uh, that the industry spends 86% of our investment on preventing infiltration, and 14% spread out across the other five stages that I'm going to talk about. That basically says that we're going to fight the entire war here. And we're going to assume that if someone passes this stage, they get that initial beachhead, then we've lost, because we're not investing at all in finding them once they're inside. And that seems really problematic to me. Discovery is all about expanding on that beachhead. It's about finding other systems, access to broader areas of the organization, and eventually the ability to discover and capture additional assets, because that's what it's really all about. So during the capture phase, attackers identify and bring under their control in some form uh, whatever the core assets they're after are, probably intellectual property, private information, et cetera. And then the final phase is uh, they exfiltrate those data back out of the organization. And Focusing in here on discovering the adversary once they're already in the organization and monitoring and protecting those key assets so that just because they have access to a system doesn't mean they have access to or especially the ability to then exfiltrate the assets protected by or leveraged by that system. Um, that's where we need to focus and that's where a collaborative response can be very effective because the techniques that attackers use to infiltrate organizations and the approaches that they use to discover and capture more assets once they're inside are often quite common between different targets. And the more information we can share about either breadcrumbs that indicate an infiltration or malicious activity that represents an expansion of that infiltration, the more we can prevent those earlier, identify those earlier in other organizations. And this is really the, the core idea of the collaborative or community-based approach that I want to talk about. So I'm not the first person to talk about sharing or collaboration in the industry. Um, this has been a, a popular topic for the last year or two and, uh, and a topic among niche circles for many years before that. Um, in particular, groups like the ISACs, uh, FS ISAC for financial services, IT ISAC for my industry, um, have built small communities of peer organizations that do share with one another and do effectively form circles of trust. But these approaches, ISACs and others, suffer from some pretty significant limitations today, and I think that's uh, restricted how widely adopted they are and how much impact they've had on the industry. So some of the challenges are, and I'm not just picking on ISAC, I think there are other organizations that, that fit this bill, um, relatively manual and slow to act on. So they require copying and pasting information between otherwise disconnected systems, and they typically rely on a human analyst to um, really synthesize, understand, and then act on the information that they provide. And that takes a lot of skill and a lot of human cycles, a lot of time. They have limited participation, and this partly has to do with the way they've grown up. They've built up around particular industry verticals and, in most cases, geographic regions within those verticals. And those groups are trusting of one another, but not necessarily interested in broadening out that circle of trust, or at least they historically haven't been. I think we're seeing some signs that that's changing. Um, by having sort of artificially limited participation, though, they get a very narrow, very... Um, uh, uh, influenced view on the landscape because of who participates in them. And that necessarily makes collaboration and a unified response less effective. And then finally, uh, and this kind of has to do with the, 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 the slowness that I talked about earlier and the need for a human analyst, these organizations and communities tend to produce intelligence that's not directly actionable. They produce information that is useful for a human analyst to, to act on or to make sense of at least, um, but not something that will necessarily feed directly into an IPS or another network security product or, or something that you can do to prevent the attack. So what are some important aspects of a different approach to this? How can we sort of uh, address some of those weaknesses of current approaches to sharing or to collaboration? Um, there are three key principles that I want to talk about. 
One is, organizations today don't need another intelligence feed. They, in fact, uh, typically don't have enough analysts in their security operations center to deal with the intelligence that they're already receiving. And so to be a big benefit to those organizations, uh, a community really needs to produce intelligence that's directly actionable. Um, it needs to be uh, automated. Effectively, its consumption needs to be automated in most cases. And that doesn't mean that it needs to address the super high value, very complex attacks that an analyst would typically be focused on. Rather, an automated approach should focus on a dealing with the more commoditized type attacks in an automated way with as little human intervention as possible and then freeing up those human analysts to focus on the more complex, more insidious, more targeted attacks. They need to produce, or a community needs to produce, intelligence that is contextually relevant. It's great to read a 60 or 70 page report on a group uh, in another continent and learn all about their motivations and all about their membership and where their buildings are and, and, and all the rest. That may or may not be the most important thing to my organization today. And if I'm a CISO or a director of security somewhere in the organization, my job is to keep my company, my organization safe. And I need intelligence that is um, filtered and targeted to be relevant to me and my organization and the threats I face. And then finally, um, we believe that an open approach and one that's based on common standards is the only way for a community like this to be effective. Um, without openness, you end up with vendor lock-in, and you end up with just as those existing groups have a narrow view based on the type of company they are and where they live in the world, without open standards, a, a community built around sharing intelligence is going to be locked into a, a particular vendor's view of the world and what their, their products are capable of identifying or protecting against. And that would be really limiting in terms of the community benefit of what we're talking about. So to give you an idea of the, the kind of automated system that I'm proposing here, uh, this is just a, a simple kind of flow chart of a community. In the center, we have a, a cloud-based system that includes a forum and a big database of uh, shared or analyzed intel. On the left-hand side, you have an individual member that has access to that community and can submit and receive information from it. You have a community of other members and then you have some back-end sources of intelligence, ranging from open source intelligence to licensed commercial feeds to targeted research that, uh, that HP could provide if this is our community or that someone else could provide if they were hosting it. When a, a member sees a new attack and they want to see what the community knows about that attack or that threat, uh, or they want to share, maybe they already know everything about it, but, but let's say they don't yet, and they want to they expand their knowledge, they want to connect some more dots, they submit a query, maybe from their SIM product, into the, the central community. That's shared out with the rest of the members who can then uh, basically review that, collaborate on it, and, uh, and uh, correlate the information contained from the initial subscriber with other events or mitigations that they've identified locally. They can then share that analysis back with the community, it can be enriched or correlated with other external sources. So I think the main value here is the community information, but maybe there's additional information to connect the dots or provide additional context on top of that. And then the results are shared back with the initial subscriber. To give you an idea of some problems you could address with this, and these are just uh, some simple examples, but I'll, I'll share them with you anyway. Um, imagine brute force login attempts. I think a prime example of a very commoditized attack, not something that keeps people awake at night, not something that uh, gives people a promotion or causes them to lose their jobs, but a real problem for, for many applications, many systems today. The current approach is the attacker attacks, tries to log in, tries some more, maybe you catch that in the application, maybe you catch that on the wire in an IPS, and then eventually you figure out, hey, this guy is brute forcing me, I'm gonna tell my sim about the IPs that he's attacking me from or the techniques he's using, and I'm going to try to block him on the wire. Now, across a community of similar targets, you probably see the same attackers using the same techniques to try to take down multiple organizations. And the current approach is that all of those people are basically on their own. They each have a lead up of attacks that they use to identify the problem, and then eventually they put a protection in place. Imagine if these three companies were collaborating. They were part of uh, a community or uh, a system like the one I showed on the previous slide. Uh, now, company A sees an attack 
and it reports, hey, I saw this IP address brute force login, uh, trying to do a brute force, force login on me. Uh, hey, community, watch out for this attacker. Now, that allows the community to share with other companies, imagine company D who's just participating in the community, information about that brute force login attempt, but with a very low confidence. One member of the community saw it, hey, you should be on the lookout for it too. Now, that same attacker goes after company B. Company B is also part of the community. They tell the central server, hey, this attacker uh, came after me with a brute force login attempt. Now, the central server, the community, is able to say, I've seen this from two different sources. I've seen the same attacker target two different organ member organizations. I've got a little more confidence that that's a bad guy, that that's something that we should be on the lookout for. So I'm going to raise the score on that intelligence that I share with other members of the community. And then finally, you see where this is going. A third company sees the same attacker, same technique, shares it with the community. Now the confidence score is much, much higher because it's been correlated across three organizations. And in particular, a subscriber to this community could then put a rule in place to take automated action if enough other members of the community have seen a given behavior. So maybe one or two wasn't enough, but once three other companies saw this attacker mount the same kind of attack again and again, we're actually going to push an automated uh, protection into our uh, IPS to prevent attacks from that IP. So here the community is basically getting ahead of attackers uh, by looking at concentration or repetition of attacks across different member organizations. And it's a way for the community to then uh, basically respond much more quickly and nimbly to a series of attacks across organizations than they could previously. Another example, uh, looking at a, a multi-stage attack, something that involves some reconnaissance followed by uh, some attack phase, malware delivery or something else. Um, for the most part, these are run from different source IPs. And so just because you've identified reconnaissance doesn't mean that you're then going to be able to protect against the, the second stage of the attack. You probably have to wait and identify that second stage independently, in fact. So traditional approach, you see the attack, you see the recon, you put that into the IP, IPS. Uh, then you see some attacks from a different source, and you're not able to protect against those yet because you don't know the association between them and the initial reconnaissance. Imagine a world where you're a part of one of these sharing communities. Then, when an organization sees that initial reconnaissance, not only do they put a protection in place against that, they also query the community and say, hey, what do you know about reconnaissance from 1.1.1.1? The community can then respond with a correlation between that and the resulting attack IPs. And so if one member of the community has seen the connection between these two phases of the attack, then other members of the community can actually get ahead of potentially the reconnaissance, if that's been shared with them, but more importantly, they can get ahead of the eventual second stage of the attack, because other members of the community have made that connection, connected the dots between the reconnaissance source and the eventual attack source. And so here you're actually proactively defending against an attack that you haven't seen at all, but by seeing a precursor of it and comparing that precursor to a community source of intelligence, you're able to predict the next stage before you see any actual indication of it. So um, I think one of the most important points is that the, these communities are only as valuable as they have participation. And so if we build a community of um, IPS vendors or of banks in North America, or of security vendors. I'm going to be fine on time. Thank you. Um, as, as you build one of these communities, um, and, and I think we see this throughout the industry today, because most security vendors have some form of uh, collecting telemetry data or sharing intelligence. The more these are based on a single product or in a single geography, the more limited their view is going to be, and the less the claims I'm making about collaboration are going to be true. So we're big proponents of some standards, uh, in particular sticks and taxi being developed by MITRE on behalf of the DHS in the US. These are standards for, in the case of sticks, representing threat information, broadly speaking. And then taxi is a, a communication standard, a bus protocol for sharing that information between different systems. 
We're big proponents of this because we think if the industry actually begins to build these communities and build support for these standards into our products, then the diagram I showed before with subscribers and a community and sharing through a central server can involve any organization in the world. It doesn't matter whose product you use. It doesn't matter whether you've focused on the network layer or on another aspect of your security. You can tie into that community. You can communicate with it. And assuming there's some information there that's useful to you, you can consume and act on it in an automated way, in a machine-to-machine -machine kind of way. That's what these allow. And we think that's really, really critical for collaboration and sharing to have the kind of impact on the industry that it can. So to, to conclude, I'll leave you with this quote. Um, looking at those numbers, we spend almost 50 billion a year trying to protect against attacks. There were 20% more attacks last year than the year before, and those attacks cost 30% more than the attacks the year before did. Looking at those numbers, we really have to do something significant. Like we can't just keep going with the status quo. We have to turn things uh, on their heads somehow. And two years ago, when I talked with CISOs at financial organizations, for example, they looked at collaboration as really, um, sorry, they looked at their security posture and their ability to defend their organizations as a unique differentiator, as a competitive advantage against other organizations. And over the last two years, I think, and this is speculation, I think because we've seen so many more successful attacks, we've seen so much kind of professionalization of uh, the hacker community, those same organizations are now much more willing to work together. Um, increasingly, and this is anecdotal, I have conversations that, uh, that tell me my entire industry is worse off because of ongoing successful attacks. You know, if I'm attacked or my competing bank on the East Coast is attacked, it hurts the entire industry because it hurts our customers' confidence in online banking or in the kinds of services that we want to provide to them. Maybe it's mobile banking now. We need to protect the industry as a whole. And that, that's what I'm hearing, and I believe that that means we're ready to start to collaborate. Um, the missing piece today is the technical infrastructure to really allow that and to allow it in an automated, open, and contextually relevant way. And so there are other vendors uh, along with us. Microsoft made an announcement yesterday or the day before that they just launched, uh, launched a big automated threat sharing platform. I think there are a lot of people focused on this problem today. There are even some little startups making a business around it. I think that's good because I think that the technical infrastructure and the platform for doing these things is a must for the industry. But it's not sufficient. We have to go to the next step, which is actually to build these communities and begin to work through concerns about competition or concerns about revealing secrets about our organization so that we can start to mount that unified defense. So with that, I will uh, stop talking for a minute and hope that you guys have some questions. I know it's early in the morning, but uh, please, anybody have any questions? I've covered a lot of topics, so feel free. I don't have a, a, a specific answer to that. I can speculate. Uh, I think it's most of the things you listed. So I think our systems are, every year that goes by, more complex, more difficult to build in the first place and to fix. So that makes the, the cost of fixes go up. I think one of the big increases is actually user expectation. Right? So in more places now, we have to notify people. When we notify them, those people have um, stronger expectations about what we as an organization are going to do for them. You know, maybe it's uh, uh, identity theft uh, monitoring for a year or something like that. So basically, I think the, the impact for the organization beyond the technical fix is going up over time. Um, so I think those two are probably, if I had to list my top two, th those would be it. Yeah, the systems are harder to build, harder to fix. And um, the impact of uh, a public breach is greater in terms of the, the response necessary to, to deal with the customers and the users and the perception around it. Sorry, w wave or something. OK, there we go. <laughs> Absolutely. So two key concerns. You know, I, I listed the three that I thought were most important, automation, relevance, and openness. You, you could keep adding to that list. And, and near, 
probably four and five on the list would be trust in the platform, trust that your information isn't going to be compromised or exposed, and also trust in your peers, right? That they're not going to mislead you or that they're not going to misuse information that you share with them. And so building both a platform that can be trustworthy and a community that can be trustworthy are really important, and that's going to come down to people, basically. So we're building it uh, right now. We will host one of these that will be open, built on those open standards. Down the road, I'd like to make that platform available to other groups, though. I think there are big communities within the government who will never interact with HP on something like this. And I think there are groups in the private sector, like the ISACs. OWASP maybe is a good example. Uh, Cloud Security Alliance could do something. I think there are private groups that given the right technology platform, could go do a lot around the people part of the problem. But I don't know how, how that's going to evolve, frankly. Um, one of the concepts we're building in from the ground up is uh, multiple communities. So it's not one big uh, kumbaya, you know, happy circle of trust. It's lots of overlapping circles of trust with different degrees of trust uh, between different groups of peers, basically. And so I think you might see, even on an HP-hosted community, an OWASP subgroup that only shares within itself, for example. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. I saw a bunch of hands sort of that way. Anybody? Yeah. Well, from, from my opinion, and that increase of might also be directly linked or caused by the less money that is spent on software development itself. So for me, it just sounds a bit like so preaching to the choir, we have to build more secure software. Uh, I've spent my whole career advocating that and will continue to. The reality is we've got a bunch of pretty broken software out there already. Uh, and we, the attackers know it. That's why 84% of, yeah, of the attacks go after the software. So they know that's our weak point. We have to do something to mitigate that in the meantime while we fix, uh, we fix the software of the future. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think this kind of stuff is still really important because we're still seeing attacks on a daily basis and we can't fix the software fast enough. I also, one other comment, I'm also excited about, you know, I talked a lot about IPS and network security, blah, 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 I know. Um, I'm really excited about getting more real-time visibility into the application layer so that we can feed application layer monitoring and event information into something like this. I think if we were sharing information about the attacks specifically on software systems across different organizations, we'd be much better at fixing them, and we'd have much more data about how to prioritize which attacks were most prevalent. Um, so I think, I think there could be kind of a nice segue between the two. Each month, yeah. <laughs> so this is in closed beta with our customers right now, and it'll be launched soon. soon. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the regulators in the United States won't let me say more than soon, because I'm traded on the stock market, and then you might go buy or sell some stock based on what I say, and it would be terrible, but soon. It, 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 it's real today. People are getting real benefit from it. Um, we're going to basically grow that like a, like a good proper cloud service incrementally. <laughs> Who else? Please, sorry. <laughs> So um, government agencies, including Secret Service in the US, who focus a lot on cybercrime-related stuff, um, are a great source of intelligence. And I think one of the questions that the community broadly has to answer is how much 
do we want to collaborate there, and which direction does information flow? You know, if one of these communities I existed today, would everyone in it feel comfortable sharing what they see with the government? I don't know. I think that's a valid question. Uh, vice versa, would they feel comfortable consuming intelligence from the government and, and trusting in, in that source? I think that's probably more likely than the former, but it's, 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 a, it's a tricky question to answer, frankly, how much collaboration you see there. And I think that's one of the reasons why lots of different circles of trust with different levels of transparency make a lot of sense. Because there might be a certain kind of information that I'm willing to share with the CIA, uh, but a bunch of information that I'd rather not. Who else? Uh, I'm not going to show an example of brute force logging. Was that the question, or did I misunderstand? So is it like a thousand, a thousand attempts in one second, or whatever? Or is it, you, know, you need a common criteria for an attack in order to share that information? You need to be able to communicate what the criteria were. I don't think you need common criteria, necessarily. So when you report to the community, hey, I experienced a brute force login attack, as, as you just sort of said, that name means nothing. I need to quantify that somehow. And that's part of what the stick standard does for us, is it starts to let us represent the different aspects of a threat in a uh, structured, machine-readable way. And that then makes the ability to communicate and hopefully take automated action based on that information possible. I was going to say easier, but, but actually possible. Please. So we're incredibly focused on the software layer. I think, you know, based on obviously our acquisition of Fortify, our continued investment there, we think that's one of the most important aspects of security. For us, it's one of the fastest growing areas of the business. So that, that's a nice sort of reinforcement that we keep investing there. You know, the scientists think it's a good idea and the finance people do too. Um, I think there's a bunch of opportunity for both better runtime monitoring in close to real time of the application layer and of application internals, and for more active defense or response at the application layer without rewriting the code and redeploying the system. How that fits into this and what the specific sort of low-hanging fruit are, I can't say today, but it's a, an area of very active research for us, and we think it's really important. Um, kind of to the point I made before. There's a ton of broken software out there right now. And we can and should fix all of it or throw it away if we can't fix it. But we got to keep using it in the meantime. And so we need to, to you know, put the spare tire on so we can get to the mechanic shop, I guess. All right. Winding down. Any more? All right. Oh. No, I was just saying. So one minute to spare. I've, I've done well. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time this morning. <laughs> <laughs>